The question of what awaits us after death has long troubled humanity. Religion, mysticism, and science have grappled with the topic for ages, but there's a simpler solution. If you want to know what it's like being dead, just ask a dead person. Okay, maybe it's not that simple, but that doesn't stop people from trying. Necromancers in modern media don't so much speak with the dead as much as raise them to do their bidding in the form of zombies or skeletons or other kinds of shambling corpses. Historical necromancers were less interested in summoning bodily servants, though there is a bit of that, and more into speaking with the spirits of the dead, as well as other otherworldly beings, usually to get their advice on important matters. Depending on the era, that sort of thing was either acceptable practice or high heresy, especially since necromancy was often lumped in with general black magic like witchcraft. In fact, the necro part of necromancy has, in this context, been conflated with the root negro, which means black. Today though, I'll just be examining the history of interacting with the dead and leave the curses and other voodoo for a future video. Actually, that's not quite right, because there will be some voodoo today. The earliest necromancers were probably what we would call shamans, who commune with spirits, both of formerly living creatures and of natural elements. Funerals go back at least 300,000 years, so it's likely that the first attempts to communicate with the dead go back that far as well. By the time we get to historical times, the practice of necromancy is well attested, sometimes with instructions. Ancient Mesopotamian priests performed rituals to summon and speak with the dead. The British Museum's Irving Finkel describes a ritual whereby a necromancer would put a skull on the table, anoint it in oil, and burn what he calls heady material around it. When all this is done, the sun god, who really should know better, brings up from below the ghost of the dead person, who goes into the skull like that. And then the exorcist, or the specialist, the necromancer, asks the spirit a question, and you're supposed to get a true answer by means of the skull from this dead person who's inside it. He then says that he's been dying to try it out, by which I'm pretty sure he means that he'd like to be the summoner and not the summonee. An ancient Egyptian papyrus tells its reader to put stones, an ass's dung, or an amulet on a brazier to speak to dead people, and to put apes' dung on the brazier to send them away. While the Egyptian Book of the Dead, as featured in The Mummy, contains spells that help a spirit navigate the underworld, as well as allowing people to communicate with those spirits. In Greece, the Necromantion was a temple supposedly built on the door to Hades, where supplicants could go to commune with the dead. It was in this temple that Periander, the tyrant of Corinth, supposedly spoke with his dead wife, whom he had killed previously, and then, according to the historian Herodotus, baked his bread in a cold oven. In other words, Periander wasn't just into necromancy, but also necrophilia. The Roman Emperor Nero had his mother Agrippina murdered, details of which you can learn about in one of my other videos. He was supposedly haunted by her ghost, including being pursued by the Furies, the Roman spirits of vengeance. So he sought out Persian necromancers to speak with his mother, in hopes of appeasing her tortured soul. Centuries later, in 1099, the ghost of Nero himself was supposedly exorcised from a square in Rome. This all brings up an interesting question. Why did the ancients believe that the spirits of dead people could tell the future or otherwise help them in the first place? One explanation comes from Plato, who believed that a pure soul, separated from the coarseness of the body, had supernatural perceptive powers. Whatever the reason, necromancy was, pardon the pun, alive and well in ancient times, and often regarded as an integral part of religious practice, common enough to be referenced in sources such as Homer's Odyssey and the Bible. That wouldn't always be the case, though. As you might expect, the Christian Church frowned upon necromancy, claiming that only God had power over the dead. As a result, anyone claiming to speak with the dead was instead being deceived into consorting with demons. In 1326, Pope John XXII issued a papal bull condemning demonic magic, including the summoning of spirits, and ordered excommunication for anyone performing it. The Pope himself, quote, feared magical assaults and assassination attempts on his own person, showing that he believed such rituals and the results of their practice to be completely real. Nevertheless, that didn't stop some clerics from attempting magic spells and necromantic rituals, or at least that's what their political enemies accused them of, much like the later witch trials in colonial America. Several popes were accused of necromancy by their rivals, but apart from these instances involving very high-profile individuals, there's very little on record about medieval necromancy. One notable exception was the case of an Italian woman named Genta Simitri. According to the criminal report, with the assistance of four Franciscans, Simitri entered the cemetery of San Francisco at nighttime completely naked in honor of the devil and exhumed corpses whose members were being used to prepare magic potions. 
The friars who helped her went unpunished, but Symmetri herself became a friar of a sort. She was burned at the stake. Most of the magic performed in those times by the common folk like Symmetri came in the form of healing and warning spells, astrology, potions, and non-necromantic forms of divination. But to the church it was all demonic, which might have led to the perception that the practice of necromancy was rife. In modern gaming, spells with necromantic elements are commonplace and have effects like inflicting diseases or other negative conditions. These don't have anything to do with the dead exactly, but are probably derived from the fact that necromancy was often lumped in with other kinds of black magic. Some of the Catholic Church's hostility toward magic might also have been due to its greater acceptance among Jews and Muslims, as well as the pagans of antiquity, all of which stood contrary to Christian dogma. But some necromantic texts attempted to invert the popular belief, by saying that only their practitioner's intense faith in God and the bestowing of his grace could allow them the kind of power needed to control the spirits or demons they summoned. I'll be sure to give that one a try the next time a bunch of angry villagers at Pitchforks come after me for attempting a dark ritual. Only in modern times does the notion of necromancers raising the dead rather than speaking to them become more of a central theme. Such an idea could still be considered an extension of previous necromantic practice where the spirit might be summoned to fill a vessel such as a skull, but in this case the vessel is a corpse. For the most part this is a literary, film, and gaming trope, but there is at least a little historical basis for it all, stemming from the origin of the best known example of the walking dead, the zombie. The concept of the zombie originated in Africa and was brought over to the New World via the slave trade. In Haitian folklore, a necromancer called a bokor could raise a corpse to do his bidding for as long as he wanted. This had parallels to the real situations faced by many enslaved African people in the Americas who faced a life of eternal servitude. In the 1980s, anthropologist Wade Davis traveled to Haiti and made the case that zombification could be made possible through chemicals that made victims believe they had been raised from the dead, putting them in a trance-like state akin to a shambling animated corpse, and making them pliable to suggestion. Davis interviewed a Haitian man named Clervius Narcisse, who claimed to have been turned into a zombie by a voodoo bokor and forced to be his slave for two years, only regaining his senses after the bokor died and stopped administering the drug. His research was controversial and has been rejected by most of the scientific community, though his book about Narcisse was the basis for the 1988 Wes Craven film The Serpent and the Rainbow. Of course, no discussion of zombie movies and their impact on modern media is complete without mentioning George Romero's 1968 classic Night of the Living Dead which made popular the notion of zombies as mindless hordes, an idea that's been copied by countless movies and games since. Romero's movie, and many other works, don't feature a necromancer who raises and controls the dead, sometimes giving no explanation at all for the condition, or attributing it to scientific causes like radiation or disease. 1932's White Zombie is a better example of an early film that broadly sticks to its source material, with a Haitian voodoo master turning people into zombie slaves. And then there was that fantasy novel that came out in 1955 that features one of the main characters summoning an army of undead warriors to do his bidding. You've probably seen the movie adaptation of it. Science fiction also has its share of necromancy, as Frankenstein's monster could be considered a kind of animated dead, being assembled from corpses and given a semblance of life, with the doctor himself playing the role of the necromancer. And consider the Borg in Star Trek, who check all the boxes of zombification, complete with a powerful necromancer, the Borg Queen, controlling her minions, if not raising them directly. Whatever form their magics take, necromancy and necromancers are wildly popular today, both as heroes and villains, even if their most common incarnations today bear little resemblance to their historical counterparts of antiquity. That's probably because zombies and curses are generally more interesting than simply speaking to the dead. Historical wizards didn't sling fireballs, and even the most powerful clerics couldn't instantly close up wounds, so maybe it's just how things are meant to be, that spellcasters have been reinvented for the modern age to be more exciting and impactful, especially in combat. Consider it a challenge then. The next time you want to play a necromancer, do it old school and focus on divination and maybe the occasional summoning of a spirit to do your bidding, and leave the zombies behind. Which shouldn't be too hard. They tend to be pretty slow. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed learning about necromancers and have some great ideas for how you'd like to incorporate them into your next game. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and leave a comment letting me know what topic you'd like me to cover in the future. See you next time!